Yeah, th th thanks for the intro there, Bob. Uh, so I, I actually met, met Robert like almost exactly 20 years ago. Um, I think it was in, in September of 1999. He was uh, doing a book tour uh, for, at, at that time, you know, his, his latest book was Entering Space. I had actually re read uh, The Case for Mars like a month earlier, went, went to, um, you know, see his talk, and, and I was just like extremely inspired uh, by, by the overall uh, vision that, that he was laying out for expanding humanity into space and why that's important, uh, you know, really for humanity as a whole to en energize us and, and help us move forward. So, you know, definitely very memorable, uh, you know, experience there. And then, you know, as he was saying, you know, d did a lot of things while, while I was in college related to the Mars Society, really do doing anything I could to try to um, make that vision reality, having, you know, people uh, living on Mars. So I uh, want to definitely thank you for that, uh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have, you know, I will say I have heard him, uh, you know, sing a few times before as well. <laughs> or maybe it was Boris, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, in terms of SpaceX, SpaceX was established uh, with, with the goal of making uh, life multiplanetary to uh, allow human civilization to move forward uh, living on, on multiple planets. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, it's really focused on, you know, what is it going to take to make this, this happen? Um, so that, you know, I met, you know, Robert, you know, and got involved in the Mars site 20 years ago. Let's say, you know, in 20 years' time, uh, can we have, you know, a Mars Society, you know, uh, convention, you know, in a, in a space like this, you know, on, on Mars? Uh, so, in, in terms of in terms of what what's going to be needed to, to make that happen, uh, th there, there's all sorts of things. I mean, if you look around, you know, here, you know, we're in you know basically downtown Los Angeles. Uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of different different things involved in, in having a city, uh, you know, be built and, and operated. And you know, when we talk about cities on Mars, we're going to need need all those same sorts of things as well. So, um, you know, it's something where you know we at SpaceX are very focused on the, the getting there uh, part of the problem. Uh, but I, I really also encourage you know all of us to think about the, the broader uh, set of capabilities that will be needed. You know, uh, you know, from you know, food, food and 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 uh, you know, uh, housing to um, you know, pow power and you know, other utilities and so on uh, to, to make this sort of thing happen. Um, now, on, on the SpaceX side, our, our focus is towards really reducing the cost of transporting cargo and people uh, to places uh, like Mars. We see that, you know, in order to have, have that vision uh, be a reality, uh, it, it has to be a very affordable, um, you know, there has to be a very affordable means of uh, transport. So our focus towards that is to have a fully reusable uh, transportation system. Uh, we've been making a lot of progress uh, in regards to that with our uh, Falcon 9 uh, vehicle on, on the first stage, having the um, you know, first stage go up, uh, accelerate the second stage up to a high energy uh, condition, then having that first stage come back, uh, land and be reused. Um, we've been doing that uh, you know, qu quite, a quite a few times now, it, it's, it's becoming you know, almost uh, you know, regular occurrence at this point. Uh, thank you. And uh, we're we're you know g getting ready at this point uh, to to you know reuse one of one of those uh, first stages for the, the, the fourth time, and we're going to be just um, you know increasing it from there. Uh, that said, to to really you know enable something like this, we we think that we need to uh, decrease the cost e even further. So so for that. Uh, we're developing our next generation uh, launch vehicle, which um, is basically the Starship. Uh, you can think of that, you know, similar to the space shuttle as being the entire vehicle. Uh, additionally, it's the, the, the second stage uh, portion of the vehicle on top, and then our super heavy uh, rocket that we have as the first stage to help accelerate uh, that vehicle uh, into space. So 
unlike Falcon 9, which is a, a partially reusable vehicle reusing the first stage, uh, with Starship and Super Heavy, we're going to go to a fully reusable system. So we'll be reusing not only that first stage, but also the second stage. Uh, we see that as... as <laughs> yeah. see, see that as being critical to de decrease the cost, allow us to take very large amounts of cargo, uh, you know, be beyond Earth. Uh, you know, additionally, in, in, in addition to being able to be fully reusable, we also need to have a pretty significant uh, payload capability. Um, you don't want to be, you know, building, uh, you know, a, a city out of, you know, you know small container uh, sized things. You want to be able to move, you know, lar large cargo, uh, large numbers of people. So um, we're developing the vehicle to effectively have a 150 ton uh, payload capability for launch into Earth orbit, and then by making use of propellant transfer, it, uh, we can then take that same uh, payload onto the surface of the Moon and Mars. Uh, th that allows us to, you know, re really have a very low uh, cost for delivery here, um, and combined with the, uh, you know, the fact that it's fully reusable, we'd actually expect that the marginal cost for a launch um, is actually less than the cost of launching a Falcon 9. Um, so, you know, it's kind of this, you know, str strange thing that I think people, you know, haven't fully, fully grasped yet, but even though it has a very large payload capability, uh, we expect the, just the cost per launch to be, uh, you know, significantly lower than what's available now. Uh, as you increase your flight rate, it's important to have a propellant that's also, you know, relatively inexpensive. Uh, so methane is the least expensive uh, fuel available uh, here on Earth. So we're using methane oxygen on both stages of the vehicle. Uh, that also helps out from the standpoint of having a, a common engine and common propellant uh, to really minimize the amount of development work you have to do and, and even just things like the maintenance on your launch site and so on by having that, that common uh, propellant that, that can help you there. And then of course methane and oxygen are very useful uh, when it comes to Mars in terms of being able to make them uh, on the surface um, and also behave well overall in terms of your ability to store them uh, in space uh, while still having, you know, quite good performance. Uh, I mentioned already the fact that we're using propellant transfer. Uh, that, that's what we use in order to basically take a, a two-stage fully reusable uh, launch vehicle that's able to take a very large payload into low Earth orbit uh, and then effectively turn it into a three-stage, much larger uh, vehicle uh, to uh, head out to, um, you know, basically high, higher energy destinations. So, um, you know, probably the most relevant for, for this group, obviously, is the surface of Mars um, and, uh, you know, something that, you know, can also support missions to the moon and, and really elsewhere in the solar system. Um, of course, you have, to, you have to be able to land, so that's a, a key focus of our development, as well as have a robust landing system that can, can land on a, a num number of different uh, locations. Um, so not something that can just work on Earth or just work on Mars or just work on the moon, but something that can uh, cover that full spectrum of capabilities. And then uh, in terms of this, this vehicle overall right now, uh, it's something that we're, we're moving forward uh, with building and testing. In terms of what, what this all looks like for the M Mars architecture, uh, this is a picture. I'm gonna actually going to come back to it uh, a little bit later on so you don't have to memorize all of it. Um, Yeah, the, um, so over on the left there, uh, basically we use, you, we use the, the booster and the ship, um, you know, basically as that two-stage uh, vehicle to get up into Earth orbit. Uh, we fill up the propellant tank, so we're basically leaving Earth orbit uh, with a vehicle that's uh, more, more or less has, has full tanks. It can then use that to go accelerate off to Mars. Um, can do a, you know, relatively fast transfer uh, going there, you know, four to six months, uh, you know, would be pretty typical. Uh, and then uses the atmosphere to, to slow down uh, and, and enter and land. For, for the return back, uh, we would then make use of uh, local resources, so, so water uh, fr from the surface and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make our propellant to return back to Earth. Um, we could then uh, do a single stage return from the surface all the way back, again, uh, using the atmosphere at Earth to help decelerate us, uh, slow down and land. So that, that, that's the sort of overall uh, architecture. This has been, you know, consistent, uh, you know, for quite a while. We've been, I think, working, you know, in some depth on, on this for, uh, you know, a little over four, four years, and, and this aspect of it has been, uh, you know, quite stable. 
that said, we have been working a lot on all the, the details on the vehicle itself and, and what's involved uh, in doing this in an efficient fashion. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit uh, more about the, the status of that in a second here. Uh, so the, the first stage, what we call super heavy, uh, is nine meters in diameter. The entire vehicle is nine meters in diameter. Uh, it's about 68 meters, meters tall. Uh, it's drawing on a lot of the lessons we've learned from Falcon 9 uh, reuse. So we have grid fins up at the top of the vehicle to help guide it back to the launch site. Uh, landing legs, we've actually simplified uh, that relative to Falcon 9 in terms of uh, minimizing the, the complexity of the mechanisms there and um, allowing us to, to much more rapidly uh, recycle the vehicle around. But, you know, you know, if we'd gone back, I think, you know, 10 years ago and said we had a, a, a first stage with, you know, 31 or 37 engines, uh, people would have thought, oh, that's impossible. Um, you know, Falcon Heavy, though, has uh, 27 first stage engines, and in many ways the uh, configuration here is actually even simpler uh, for, for us than that. So I think we've, you know, again, lear learned a lot through all the developments uh, to date that are leading forward to um, getting this uh, part of the vehicle flying. Now, the, the emphasis on this is really just to, you know, add earth, get, get the second stage, the, the ship, up to a high velocity condition such that it can uh, then proceed onto orbit. Uh, but we don't really need this beyond earth. It's, it's really just uh, to get out of the high, uh, deep gravity well here. Uh, the, the part that's you know got a lot more uh, you know new aspects to it um, from from the standpoint of the, the overall functionality relative to what we've uh, done to date is is the Starship. So this vehicle uh, is basically the second stage, but it combines the propulsion aspects of a second stage together with the payload uh, elements of what would typically be in a fairing uh, for launch of satellites or you know something like the you know the spacecraft for for Dragon, uh, and it's able to basically keep those uh, elements together and, and go and serve as a, uh, both a launch vehicle uh, stage and an in-space uh, vehicle. So that provides a lot of flexibility uh, for, for those various maneuvers. Um, additionally, in, in order to be a fully reusable vehicle, uh, th this part of, part of the system is also uh, recoverable. So we're able to bring this back down uh, to the surface of the Earth, um, go, go through entry, uh, do, do our landing, uh, and get it recycled around to, to fly again. Uh, this is all powered by our, our Raptor engines. Uh, for the ship, we have a set of sea level engines that we use for that landing, uh, along with vacuum optimized engines uh, that we use uh, for the bulk of the uh, impulse uh, in space. And we can trade uh, basically in terms of the effective uh, specific impulse of, of the system versus uh, the thrust level just based upon where we are in our trajectories and what types of maneuvers uh, we're, we're looking to do. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, good flexibility there that, that helps us have a very versatile system. This, this is a picture of three of those uh, Raptor engines on one of our uh, prototype vehicles. So these are basically what we call the landing engines. They're the three, one, three engines that we would use for a landing. We also use them uh, during the ascent and, and to, for any high thrust uh, maneuvers. Uh, to have the vehicle come back in uh, through the atmosphere, we have to survive you know, a very high heating environment. So that does, does require a heat shield as well. Uh, the approach that we're taking there um, is to, uh, for, for one, ha have most of the vehicle actually able to withstand relatively high heat uh, to begin with. So uh, the primary structure of the vehicle is made out of stainless steel. Uh, that's been one of the changes over the past year uh, to, um, that's really helped uh, speed up the development of, of the system, uh, get, it, get, it, uh, get it flying, and it also has um, a number of benefits in terms of the overall system level of being able to uh, withstand those, those high temperatures of, of uh, entry much better than you know, aluminum or carbon fiber uh, type of structure would, mean that which then means you need less um, you know, very high performance uh, thermal protection material for it. That said, in the high heating areas, you do, you do still need, um, you know, something that can withstand that uh, extreme uh, heating and uh, be, be reusable. So for that, uh, we're basically um, take, taking the lessons from the space shuttle program in terms of some of the uh, things that they learned through the course of their uh, activities there to, to make a much uh, more robust uh, cer ceramic, um, you know, radiative and insulative uh, thermal protection system. So, so we're, we're uh, 
basically building um, right now uh, the capability to, to manufacture large quantities of that material, uh, get it installed in a rapid fashion, and uh, really cover up the, the aspects of that high heating uh, for, for this vehicle. I uh, mentioned the, the Raptor engine, um, you know, uh, al already. Uh, th this was, um, this, this engine uh, is a full flow uh, methane oxygen stage combustion engine. Um, we did a, a whole series of development tests with a smaller scale uh, engine over the last several years. Um, basically, uh, you know, about half the thrust of, of the current engine. Um, but earlier this year, we, we got um, the, the flight version of that Raptor uh, onto the test stand. So. This is a um, video uh, of one of those, one of those firings. <laughs> a little too loud, maybe. Um, so, you know, with the methane oxygen, you get this nice blue, uh, you know, clean clean flame. Uh, you know, that's an aspect of the propellant combination that also helps out uh, for for reusability. Um, having uh, you know l less soot uh, build up in, in your engine, uh, the, the um, you know we're we're been uh, doing a whole, whole series of tests on these across different throttle levels. We've you know been up to you know 105 percent power, um, throttle them down for uh, landing tests, th things of that nature. We're also ramping up the overall production on these. We think had you know over 12 or so. Uh, into um, testing at this point and working to uh, increase the production rate even, even further there. Uh, so in addition to the, the engine itself, uh, one of the key elements is understanding how to build these large uh, stages and, and understand the interaction uh, between the engine and the stage. Um, we're, again, trying to cut down the cost as much as possible, so we're actually using uh, autogenous pressurization uh, for the vehicle. So we're taking a portion of the oxygen uh, that goes, goes to the turbo pump, uh, gasifying that, sending that back up into the oxygen tank uh, to pressurize that tank. Similarly, uh, taking a, a portion of the methane um, you know, up to high pressure and, and sending that back, back into the tank. And that allows us uh, to get rid of helium uh, as a pressurant on the vehicle. Helium uh, is actually quite expensive. Uh, it's uh, particularly in the quantities that you would want um, you know, for this type of vehicle, uh, that's something where um, being able to instead just use the, you know, quite low cost um, and high, uh, you know, density storage from the cryogenic uh, propellants can, can help us out uh, there. And that also, um, again, helps when we're looking at Mars and things like that. There's not, not, not a very readily available uh, source of helium there. So being able to instead uh, use your own propellants for pressurization helps out. Um, that said, that's one, one of the things that we've been looking to do is understand the interaction there uh, between the engine and, and the propulsion stage, along with how, how the overall um, you know, tanks get built and, and, and work out there. So we've been doing a series of tests uh, with our Star Hopper uh, vehicle. So here, here's um, the, the, uh, basically the final, final flight of that uh, vehicle in August of this year. So yeah, that, that, that vehicle is nine meters in diameter. Uh, the nice clear flame. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the full, full diameter of the, the Starship. It's basically the uh, so somewhat shorter version of the propul propulsion tank uh, from the vehicle. Yeah, th yeah, there's no one on that. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're uh, <laughs> there is a silhouette of a person painted on it for scale, but. Uh, thanks. So, so this was uh, at our uh, Texas. Um, our South Texas test facility, uh, what we call Boca Chica, it's basically as far south as you can go in Texas and still be in Texas. 
Um, you know, like at the very ed edge of that, that view is basically the, the, um, the Mexican border. Uh, so, so this area is you know, right, right by the, um, the Gulf of Mexico there. Uh, we're, um, have been building up this site uh, you know, really basically over the last year or so to, to uh, be able to do this testing along with manufacturing the vehicles themselves there. Uh, so we, we have the, this facility uh, down, down in Boca Chica uh, near Brownsville, Texas. Um, and then in parallel, we're also uh, building um, vehicles at the Cape. Uh, so over on the left is the, the next uh, prototype vehicle, what we're calling Mark 1. In this case, it's the full, the full, the full scale vehicle, all, all the um, aerodynamic surfaces and everything else that we need uh, for that that we built in Boca Chica. And then the picture on the right uh, is a picture from uh, Florida. Uh, and uh, we have another vehicle, um, you know, maybe harder to see in, in the picture there, but um, you know, the main uh, tanks and such in the background, uh, most of the nose cone in the front, and then the very tip of the nose cone over on the left, uh, all, all coming together in Florida, and then uh, also a lot of barrel sections there for the next uh, vehicle after that. Uh, really uh, trying to uh, speed up the pace of development uh, on this and overall spur innovation by having two sites um, that are in a friendly competition to um, you know, drive forward, get, get the vehicles built and flying and into testing such that we can learn as much as we can, as quickly as we can, um, and to do that all in a you know, collegial fashion where we're sharing uh, lessons learned across the sites. They're you know, in constant communication, but uh, they get to set their own path in terms of what's going to be uh, fastest to get the vehicle built. And I think we've already seen a lot of uh, very good improvements there in terms of you know, one place trying out something that's a little different from another, uh, seeing that that worked really well, and then the other site uh, picking up a, a similar approach. So for this um, uh, vehicle here, what we're going to be testing out uh, with that is basically um, the overall uh, landing sequence uh, for this vehicle. We, the, the vehicle flies basically in a sort of side-on um, condition uh, through, you know, subsonic uh, flight, uh, maximizing the, the drag area on it. Um, one sec. So, here we go. <laughs> so cute. Um, so, basically, in in uh, hypersonic and supersonic, we're fl uh, flying about 60 degrees to the, the flow. Uh, that's letting us maximize uh, the drag to, to slow us down as much as possible, while also still having sufficient lift to uh, control the trajectory. Uh, as, it, as it enters uh, in uh, to, to basically manage the overall heat that the, the vehicle is seeing um, on that, that heat shield. As it comes, so it's more or less flying you know, horizontal through mo most of the entry. Uh, as it then comes t towards uh, subsonic and sort of thermal condition, it's almost falling uh, you know, vertically uh, side onto the flow. Um, that, that's letting us really use as much of this area as possible for, for drag, uh, keep keeping uh, the velocity that we need to uh, you know, uh, remove with the engines as, as low as possible. And then we're using a fairly non-conventional approach of, of basically modulating the, uh, the forward uh, flaps and the, the rear flaps, almost more like what a skydiver would, would do to control uh, their trajectory coming in to adjust for any wind disturbances and so on such that we can uh, target the, the landing site and arrive there. Um, so, in terms of what, what that will uh, look like, uh, th this is an example of the, the subsonic uh, flight there. You see the forward and aft flaps uh, actuating. They're, they're actuated al along a line uh, fa fairly close to parallel to the vehicle. So, uh, th again, th th these are basically are not, not really wings or, or flaps in the traditional sense of something creating lift. They're more actually modulating drag uh, than that and then able to provide some uh, side force based on the normal force against the flap. Uh, so th th this um, you know, can gu guide the vehicle in. Uh, you can see it's going at a pretty, pretty low velocity uh, there. Um, and then uh, for the final portion of flight, we basically have to do a reorientation maneuver now to, to bring the, the engines uh, uh, first uh, and do the final propulsive landing. So this is what we're going to be testing out 
uh, with that prototype vehicle uh, that you saw the picture of there. So, this is basically a, sim a simulation of what that's gonna gonna look like. This is our trajectory, you know, simulation code, and then uh, visualization layer on top. I'll show that again. I think people liked it. <laughs> so, uh, not too distant, uh, you know, future next, uh, you know few weeks we'll be getting this uh, vehicle here out to, out to the pad, getting it um, through its static fire tests, and then, uh, you know, ho hopefully, uh, you know, do, doing that, the, you know, ma making that uh, animation uh, reality, uh, and I, I'm very excited about that, L really looking forward to it. You know, that said, we are taking an iterative approach where we're expecting, you know, to learn a lot as we go, and we're, we're moving fast, so, um, you know, if that vehicle, you know, has some issue, the next vehicle is going to be, you know, right after that, and the next one right after that. Um, you know, our, our approach is really to test a lot, fly a lot, uh, you know, l learn quickly and adjust um, a a as we go forward. I uh, uh, I think the the flap size is all based on just you know what's needed to uh, control the, control the vehicle, uh, have enough modulation to uh, the the lift on the vehicle to basically. Um, ad adjust from wind disturbances and so on. It's really driven uh, primarily by the Earth case um, over, say, the Mars case. Uh, there's d different trades there, but we're, we're basically able to use those same uh, aero surfaces in both locations. Uh, so a after we've uh, basically been testing out these suborbital vehicles, uh, next step after that's going to be orbit. So to give you a sense of scale for that, the, oops, the uh, that same hopper vehicle you saw earlier is over on the left. Um, there's the silhouette of the people, or person, and some real people. And this is what the launch pad looks like. And then the vehicle itself. It's a super heavy. And then the Starship. Um, so again, that, that's a um, you know, depiction of what that would look like in, in Boca Chica, Texas. We're also uh, building out a launch capability in Florida as well. Um, th this is now a depiction of how the overall you know, vehicle would, would operate. So basically the first stage would accelerate that second stage up to high velocity. Uh, we would do stage separation, and then the, the first stage is super heavy. Uh, would turn around to do a boost back burn to come back to the launch site. Uh, in order to do you know, very rapid reuse, uh, we want to be bringing you know, that first stage you know, back as quickly as we can. Um, you know, with Falcon 9, a lot of times they go downrange on a, on a drone ship, but as much as possible, we want to be bringing these back so we can turn them around quickly. Uh, you know, as that comes into land, the, the second stage of the ship would continue on to orbit, um, and then, you know, one of the key things basically beyond the, that full reuse that we're looking for is the ability to do propellant transfer. So having taken on that propellant, we're now ready to, to you know, 
really go, go on to pretty much any destination. Um, you know, it's actually le less delta V to go from low Earth orbit to the surface of Mars or the surface of the moon than it is, you know, being used to, to get to orbit to, to begin with. So having reset uh, that overall propellant state can really help us uh, with, with all sorts of different mission types. Uh, in terms of how we do that propellant transfer, um, you know, this, this is something where, you know, th there, there's been a long list of things that, you know, have never been done uh, that are involved in, in this overall architecture working. So, you know, first stage reuse is definitely, you know, a big part of that. Um, you know, operating a, a vehicle with, you know, very large numbers of engines is another one. Um, but, you know, th those, those have been done. Recovering the uh, second stage from orbit is definitely, you know, an, another one where, you know, Space Shuttle has a lot of experience there, but being able to do that in a very, you know, mass efficient uh, fashion and being able to, uh, you know, rapidly reuse that system is a, a critical ability. And then, you know, large scale uh, propellant transfer on orbit, particularly using cryogenics. So, um, you know, the, the, the Russians do, do actually a fair, fair amount of propellant transfer. That's all not, not been cryogenic though on a much smaller scale. Uh, so we're really looking to uh, scale that up with this vehicle. So our approach there is that we are actively settling uh, the vehicle that allows us to avoid some of the sort of uh, fluid dynamics and slosh and so on that you might otherwise have to deal with if you're trying to uh, transfer in true like microgravity. Um, so we use a small thrust to, to settle the propellant down um, and then differential th uh, pressure to, to shift uh, the propellant from one vehicle over into the other. Uh, this is, uh, you know, somewhat of a brute force approach, but through the architecture as a whole, uh, I think we're, we're able to leverage the very significant capabilities of it to simplify uh, the rest of the developments that are needed in order to uh, go and, and get to Mars and enable all these things we want to have happen. So this, this is something we'll be looking forward to uh, proving out in the near future as well. Uh, so all of that, you know, Coming, coming back to, to, to this chart, you know, is sort of highlighting some of the key uh, elements that we'll need to, to, to make this happen. Uh, and, you know, beyond, um, you know, just, you know, going and landing on Mars, uh, the system also opens up, you know, capabilities, for example, to deliver uh, very large payloads to the moon, set up and operate lunar bases. Uh, and because it's the same system that's being used uh, for going to the moon and going to Mars, it's not something where you have to you know, stop going to the moon in order to go to Mars, or it does not need to be something where it needs to be an either or uh, type of proposition. We can only go to the moon or we can only go to Mars. Uh, you know, we're really excited about the possibilities of doing both, ha having, you know, bases on the moon while we're uh, also setting up these cities on Mars. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if we have a microphone for questions or, or if people yell, I can probably hear them. Is it going to be coming in? Are there things that you can do to reduce those when you eventually go to Earth, Earth uh, sometime in the future? Yeah, so, so there were a couple of questions. One was about the difference between the builds at um, Boca Chica you know, versus the Cape, and um, another one was about uh, entry uh, dynamics. The vehicles are quite similar uh, be between the Cape and, um, and Boca. There's some differences in the thickness of the uh, material, you know, between the first two, we're, we're basically, you know, learn, as we learn, we're able to thin some of that down, decrease the mass. Uh, th there's other things on the manufacturing side. 
uh, but a lot of the capabilities are basically uh, the same there, and it's um, more just a, a matter of refining things. Um, as we get into the next uh, you know, version after that, we're going to be making uh, more improvements to um, decrease the manufacturing time and, and, and cost and just uh, you know, help out with the overall operability of those vehicles. Uh, in terms of the entry uh, accelerations, they're actually you know, pretty, pretty benign. Um, for, for entry from orbit at Earth, um, you know, you're, you're less than uh, three Gs or two to three Gs. Um, there are some things that could be done to, to decrease that you know, more in the future as well, but you know, relative to um, you know, some, some like capsule type uh, reentries and so on, that, that's um, you know, relatively benign. Uh, and then uh, for, for Mars, um, for the entry there, uh, we um, basically have a trade between how much acceleration uh, you, you can um, take versus uh, what entry velocity you can come in at for an arrow capture. Um, but we're able uh, to basically limit ourselves to 5Gs, which is basically the, the limit for a deconditioned uh, crew uh, that you know, NASA um, holds. So we, we can limit ourselves to 5Gs and, and still um, you know, meet those fast transit times that I was talking about. Sure. So uh, from a single stage Mars 12, uh, is it direct entry into the atmosphere or some other way? Of, uh, and then my second question is, uh, the first ISLU of uh, uh, propellant on Mars, is it going to be robotic or will you just leave the starships there and wait for humans to do the Okay, so the, uh, the questions in general were about uh, returning from Mars. Um, for the single stage from Mars back to Earth, uh, you uh, basically would be, you know, propulsive uh, departing Mars, uh, do trans-Earth injection, um, and then you would use the atmosphere, uh, most likely to first aero capture uh, into Earth orbit, um, and then subsequently uh, do, do your, um, your entry and landing. Uh, that said, there, there's a fair amount of operational flexibility uh, on the system there. Uh, in terms of what we would be doing um, you know, early on, I would expect that most of the vehicles uh, would actually stay on Mars. They're, they'll be, you know, quite valuable uh, there, uh, and, and vehicles returning would be more, you know, the extent, you know, people want to come back, they, they would be coming back in a vehicle, but at least early on, most of the ships, I think, would be, you know, stay, stay there and, and be made use of uh, on the surface. So SpaceX is moving pretty fast. What if uh, there is not enough systems developed to put inside the Starship. Like, do you plan to set up something yourself, or? Uh, are there things you, you're working on? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think th there's going to be all sorts of things that will be needed to have a city on Mars. And, um, you know, at SpaceX, we're very focused on enabling that by having, you know, a, a robust and, and low-cost transportation uh, system that, that's going to be available, uh, and you know we really want to encourage you know anyone who, who wants to you know be working on the things that will be on Mars to, to do so, um, and to think about you know what what things you know match up well with with your expertise or, or things that you want to go you know learn how to uh, do, and then and then um, you know build build the things that can fly there, figure out you know. Uh, you know what? What all the different you know businesses will be on 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 the surface of Mars? You know, uh, you know, talk about like you know, you'd probably want to have more than one you know pizzeria or something like that. <laughs> um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that from the, the SpaceX perspective, we're you know quite interested in you know enabling uh, that type of activity. You know, if if there are certain things that are, are missing and we, we need to you know help out there, I'm sure we'll we'll do that with time. But uh, as much as possible, we'd like to. You know, foster an ecosystem. A comment and a question. You do realize that Heinlein got there 70 years ago with his book, The Man Who Sold the Moon. <laughs> 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 and the question is, those grid fins, are they actually sort of like waffle arms? Yeah, they, they um, so the grid fins uh, on the, the first stage for both Falcon and, and Super Heavy um, on launch, they're kind of against the side of the vehicle, but then they deploy out uh, for um, entry, and so in that in that case, they are actually creating lift, but it's you can think of it as a whole series of uh, small wings uh, inside there that are um, you know a, as you rotate it, each one of them can can create lift and, and thus generate a side force uh, for the vehicle. So the air, air passes through it. 
Can you comment on whether there are any special issues from firing over 30 engines simultaneously on the super heavy as far as turbulence and stability and so forth and uh, how those have been addressed? So in terms of you know, firing large number of engines, there were, I think, a lot of questions. Um, you know, they, they came up, I think, even back when, you know, SpaceX was talking about a Falcon 5, people were, you know, wor worried about, you know, the dynamics of that. And then, you know, the Falcon 9, you know, uh, how is that going to work? And Falcon Heavy with 27 engines. Um, the, the step uh, to the number of engines on this is not something where I see it as having, you know, a significant um, issue there. It's more just incremental in terms of, um, you know, you know, acoustic energy and so on, but not anything that's fundamentally uh, showstopper. Hi, Paul. I'm from Marcel City, China. And uh, my question uh, is like, uh, Donald Trump said uh, we'll send American pe uh, people to Mars by 2033, right? So I want to know what is the plan? It's till 2024 20, or, or, or other time? Uh, for your uh, your plan, for Elon's plan, and uh, uh, second is uh, Elon said we will send w like one million people to Mars, right? So uh, how we can block the seats now? <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't quite ha hear the last bit of the, the last question. Last question is how to block the seats for Starship to Mars? Oh, book. Oh, okay, book. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, uh, <laughs> the reservations. Uh, so we, we're not yet taking reservations, but <laughs> uh, you know, if, if uh, people are interested, definitely let us know. Um, the on the on the question of overall timelines for this, you know, we're we're looking to uh, get get the vehicle you know into orbit. That's the the, the first thing uh, that that we'll be be doing in you know in the next you know uh, basically within the next year, um, and you know, putting putting a lot of effort into that. Uh, from there, we'll be doing things like ground transfer and so on. Uh, you know, in the past, we've talked about sending cargo missions, uh, you know, to Mars in 2022, and that, that's you know still very much on the table. And then, based on uh, the overall sequence, um, you know, being able to send you know crew missions, you know, in the next opportunity after that, uh, you know, the opportunities going to Mars are about every 26 months. Um, you'll want to um, you know put some significant you know supplies and infrastructure and so on in place to support the uh, the first crew, you want to make sure that all that's working before you actually send them, um, but, you know, uh, I don't think there's anything that's, you know, precluding that. So, um, so I was just wondering if you could talk about environmental control and life support systems, like what version of the Starship they might go in and kind of any changes you have to make from standard configurations for the long trip to Mars. Yeah, so the star, uh, Starship, you know, is has a number of different configurations, you know, some deploying satellites, uh, some uh, carrying cargo, and then uh, obviously some, some carrying uh, people. Early on, you would uh, tend to have a you know, relatively small number of people with a lot of cargo on any given ship, uh, and then, um, you know, with time, we would go to have, you know, significantly more people, um, and then depending upon the mission, uh, you'll have a duration uh, there. So for, say, a short, relatively short duration with a relatively small crew, um, such as what you might have for flying around the, you know, the Earth or going around the Moon and so on. Uh, you could use technology that's you know, fairly similar uh, to what we're using on our Crew Dragon right now. Uh, that said, when you uh, want to go to Mars, you're going to want to do something you know, that's significantly better than that. Um, that said, when you have a relatively small crew size, um, you know, the technologies that have been employed on the space station and a lot of the work that NASA has been doing um, you know, really ca can be you know, sufficient for this type of mission, uh, given that we can also uh, make use of a lot of uh, basic mass to uh, carry extra consumables, spare parts, uh, and so on. So I don't see that as necessarily being a showstopper. It is an area, though, that, that does need, need, you know, attention, and, and it's an area where, as more capabilities come online there, you can basically increase the efficiency uh, of your system. Um, but, you know, er early on, you know, mass uh, cures a lot of sins. Uh, so uh, one question and one hope. Um, given the previous designs were supposed to have about a thousand reuses for the booster and a hundred reuses for the tankers, um, and given steel's better fatigue properties to aluminium, uh, has the change to steel improved the uh, reuse of the boosters? And um, 
Any chance of you guys coming down to Australia and building these down there? I mean, we're, we're close to the equator. We've got a really good steel industry, so we'd be happy to build a bunch of them for you if you want. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, the, uh, we, we are looking uh, for the vehicle to be hi highly reusable and, and rapidly reusable. I think early on it's going to be more uh, that we'll be rolling in upgrades and so on, you know, probably before... Uh, you necessarily are running out of life in, in, in some of these vehicles. So we'll just, you know, see what time. Um, but, yeah, some of those numbers you were quoting, I think, are from, you know, three years ago or something like that. Um, you know, and those were sort of, you know, some thoughts at the time. But uh, I would imagine, you know, eventually those, those will be uh, even, uh, you know, even better. Um, and then, you know, certainly, you know, with time getting, you know, point-to-point -point trans transport on Earth, um, you know, including to, you know, back and forth to Australia could, can definitely uh, make the world, you know, a lot closer. Hi, Paul. Um, a couple questions. Uh, so I noticed that the dry mass of the Starship has gone up a little bit from 85 to 105 tons, but also the payload capacity now seems to really be firm at 150. So that's great news. I'd love to hear sort of what maybe is behind that, and then my just second follow-up question is, are you guys planning to publish a revised economic estimate anytime soon? Because the only thing out there, I think, is from Elon's 2016 talk. Yeah, so I think in the progression, so there's sort of been, you know, it's now becoming a tradition almost of having an annual, uh, you know, talk in around September uh, or so. So back uh, the first of those, which was in 2016, um, Elon laid out the, the sort of the overall um, you know, vision of things and what would be uh, needed to make um, you know, life multiplanetary established uh, cities on Mars. Uh, since then, we've more or less been, been working within that same framework and, and uh, developing you know, a lot more uh, you know, detail on the vehicle itself and, and sort of sizing it to at least initially be you know, somewhat smaller maybe than what we had you know, been thinking for the longer term there. Uh, but um, I don't think there's anything particularly, you know, surprisingly different uh, about, about the overall economics of it. We're still targeting it to be something that, you know, as we, you know, build up with experience with it, uh, you know, where large numbers of people can go, uh, really want to enable that. We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, hello, I am a student from Poland, and I have a question about the uh, trajectory, because uh, we saw the uh, simulation, and uh, I'm really curious about uh, the um, uh, how much deceleration you get from aerodynamics uh, from the atmosphere and how much uh, you get from the uh, rocket fuel and uh, at what height on Mars you uh, change your um, position because on the simulation it wasn't so clear and also on the moon uh, it, uh, you do not have any atmosphere so you would have a different type of uh, movement I, I suppose, and uh, the last question is about radiation protection. If you could uh, get into detail a little bit. Yeah, so the, on the trajectory side, the um, vehicle's basically designed to be able to land at the Earth, Moon, and Mars. Uh, depending on which of those specific cases, the you know, ratio of energy dissipated aerodynamically versus um, you know, propulsively is obviously quite different. In the case of the Moon, it's entirely propulsive. Uh, in the case of the Earth, you know, like uh, nine, over 99.9% .9 of the energy is removed aerodynamically. Uh, you know, there's this, this saying that at, at Mars, the atmosphere is, you know, thick enough to be a problem, but too thin to um, help you. I don't think that's actually true in the sense that uh, over 99% of the energy is being removed aerodynamically uh, at Mars. So um, there is an animation actually on, up on our website at spacex.com slash Mars uh, that, that shows the uh, the Mars entry traje trajectory. Um, it's shown with an older OML, but the trajectory is basically the same. Uh, and so in that case, we're, um, you know, you say com coming in at, uh, you know, 7.5 kilometers per second, slowing down to 750 meters per second or less, um, to, and uh, using that to, you know, really bleed off a lot of that, that energy. Um, for uh, radiation, for the interior uh, cabin layout, uh, we basically have, um, you know, for a, when we're sending a large number of people somewhere, uh, there's uh, both both individual cabins and then, you know, large common space. And then uh, we basically have sort of a central column uh, that can serve, serve as a radiation shelter 
uh, basically you know, very similar to the you know, original you know, you know, Mars Direct types of, types of things of using your consumables and, and waste products and so on as, as additional uh, uh, shielding such that if there were a um, solar particle event, you can, you can go in and, and take shelter there. These will be the last three questions. Hi, Paul. So you said that uh, the tanks are going to be autogenously pressurized instead of helium pressurized. Uh, how do you start the engines and the turbo pump, especially when you're at low tank pressure? Yeah, so the uh, so there, there's basically, you know, the, en the engines, as I said, are, are pressurizing the tanks using autogenous pressurization. Uh, we're also able to basically spin the engines up, um, you know, with high pressure gas and then uh, can recharge the high pressure gas as we go. Hi, Paul. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, reuse of the heat shield and how often that might need to be refurbished? Yeah, so the, the target there is a very low uh, uh, required maintenance, and we think we have a, a good approach to that. That said, uh, you know, we're going to see how it, how it goes as we fly, and we'll, you know, take that iterative approach to, you know, adjust as we go. But we're not going to be locked into, you know, one thing that we have to fly forever. We'll, we'll, we'll adjust as needed. Uh, hello, I'm interested in the sort of abort to launch, uh, so abort to uh, orbit options. Uh, is it similar to the pusher system you're developing for the Dragon 2? And what sort of design challenges do you have for um, uh, saving such a large uh, second stage? Yeah, so the, um, you know, the, ve the vehicle is, uh, as I said, quite, quite large. Um, it, depending on, you know, if you had a particular issue at different phases of the flight, you might um, do, do you know, various contingency trajectories, including things like abort to orbit. Uh, you can actually take, um, you know, depending on where, where exactly you're headed, you might end up uh, wanting to reserve a lot of propellant uh, margin for those types of issues, um, but that's not actually really a waste from the standpoint if you had to take on more propellant uh, after you get to orbit, that's, you know, you need that propellant anyways. Uh, the, you know, other thing that we're going to be looking to do is really across the board have a very fault tolerant vehicle and a uh, highly reliable vehicle, which uh, we're really going to uh, prove out through a, lo a lot of flights. Um, having that full reuse means that we can fly the vehicle, you know, many, many times to ensure that, um, you know, it's uh, something that's uh, going to be good to fly on. Uh, my question probably would be similar to what we just heard, but the point is, once the Starship enters atmosphere at a high speed, eight kilometers a second, or probably 11 kilometers a second from interplanetary space, it's subject to huge heat up. Do you have any technical solutions inside the Starship body which will help dissipate this heat? Uh, so the, uh, the question was about the, the, the heat rate on, on the vehicle, uh, what temperatures you, 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 you get to. So um, you know, the exterior of the, the, the heat shield can get to very high temperatures. Uh, that said, all, uh, almost all of that is radiated away, um, you know, from, from the, uh, the heat shield material, and it's, you know, insulative such that the back uh, side of it is not, um, you know, get, getting, you know, as hot. And then, um, you know, for example, at Earth, as you're then descending back down through the atmosphere, the atmosphere actually ends up cooling off uh, the tile as well, um, such that by the time you're landing, it's no longer, you know, uh, super hot. Uh, so type it's of purely irradiation. Uh, for the, for earth, earth entries, it's a yeah radiatively cooled, you know basically it, it radiates off. Uh, for for higher velocity entries, uh, you might um, like coming back from Mars uh, do some ablative in that case. But uh, you know the need to be you know super fully reusable is uh, less important for that. Uh, so right. <laughs> this will be the last question. Thank you. If you're going to be doing faster than Omen transfers to Mars, will this widen the launch window to something less than 26 months? So, yeah, so the, when, when you have sort of this ramp up in, in Delta V capability, uh, that, that does mean that you can launch more, more frequently than you might otherwise. Um, that said, uh, there'll still be, you know, if you want to go as fast as possible for a given Delta V, that tends to have a pretty, you know, uh, narrow window. Um, you can uh, also open up things like Venus flybys and so on. Um, but I think you know that's 
going to be something where we'll see you know how much if at all that's actually useful um, there are some cases where you can launch earlier but you arrive later which is probably not actually going to be be all, all that helpful either um, but uh, yeah there are some strategies once you have a very large fleet where you may want to um, be doing some of those types of things just uh, in terms of pairing up you know departure and arrival times and then the next departure but um, I'd say that's uh, maybe a little further down the road. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.